If you are one of those people who thinks critics don't know what they're talking about and they're all paid off, this video is not for you. Okay, just getting that clear, this is not an attack on Metacritic or critics. Hello, my name is Nara. Once again back on this channel that I use to rant about topics that I'm very passionate about to an audience with minimal numbers, but that's okay. What's the phrase? It's those who don't learn from history are doomed to repeat it. Something like that, right? And I just feel like gamers, they don't learn. <laughs> Because you see, Metacritic, or OpenCritic, as I prefer, but most people use Metacritic. Metacritic is a website that's very useful, very handy, but it has inspired just a, uh, I'll just say bad way of thinking upon gamers. It's not because it itself is flawed. It's because people are flawed. It's because, <laughs> you know, this is not an attack on Metacritic. If anything, it's an attack on you. Because if you want to talk about average review scores or average numbers, let's talk about the average person watching this video. You probably like video games. And if that's the case, you probably look at Metacritic and you craft this narrative in your own minds. You use that score to validate yourself thinking, oh, this game is good. This game is bad. I'll like this game. I won't like this game. That's pretty much what Metacritic is now. It's just a thing that gamers argue over by using these numbers that they don't really know what they mean as a uh, proof of whatever argument they're trying to say, <laughs> right? And, and in reality, if you use Metacritic for any other purpose than having a general ambiguous first impression on a game... You are stupid. But you know what? It's not your fault you're stupid. Well, it might be. But some of you, it's not your fault because it's so easy, right? You see an average score. You think it best represents what people think about that game. You know, that logic lines up. But correlation, as we've all hopefully learned, correlation is not causation. I'm going to bring up three main points as to why you should not trust meta scores, metacritic scores, you should not take them to heart. And the first point I want to bring up is the most obvious, but it's also the easiest to overlook, uh, at least from what I've seen. That's what makes it so interesting. That's why I want to start with it. I have a lot to say about this one. <laughs> and it's, it's context. There's so much more that goes into an opinion, <laughs> a belief, than just Hey, TLDR, this number out of 10. But I think the most prominent factor that can affect review scores that particularly bothers me countless times, just over and over again, is expectations. And the first example I want to use is actually the example that inspired this video. I mean, I wanted to make this video forever, <laughs> quite frankly, but... You know, I finally got propelled into motion. A certain game got its review scores this morning. It is Fire Emblem Engage. Fire Emblem Engage right now has a meta score of 82. Now, you might look at that score, and even though it's a good score, you might think, oh, that's, that's lower than I thought. That's uh, kind of underwhelming, maybe. I'm not bringing it up just because I'm interested in it, not just because I'm a Fire Emblem fan, but because I think it is a perfect example. Very relevant, because it just came out today, those scores, of how expectations can really determine how you feel about a game and thus how a game is rated. Because if you actually look at the reviews, even if you don't read it, if you just look at the individual scores which made up that 82 average, you will see that there's a lot of 8.5s, 9s, even 10s. There's several 10s. But then you'll see that there's 7s and there's 6s. I even saw a 5, which, hey, look, it's your opinion, but, like, a little ridiculous. <laughs> Basically, it's not an 82 because everybody unanimously decided, yeah, it's an 8 out of 10 game. No, it's because some people really loved it, then other people were disappointed. It's, it's somewhat polarizing, to say the least. 
Now, what does this have to do with context and expectations? Well, to figure that out, we have to think about the previous mainline Fire Emblem game. That is Fire Emblem Three Houses, one of my favorite games of all time. Now, for the uninitiated, Fire Emblem Three Houses was a big leap forward for the franchise because Fire Emblem used to be this game where it's, it's mainly tactics, right? You're going from battle to battle to battle. You're meeting all these fun characters. And the story sometimes can be great, but oftentimes it's just kind of there to propel you forward, right? By and large, that was what Fire Emblem was. Here comes three houses where you introduce all these other mechanics that are outside of battle. You emphasize more of that, uh, you know, character to character relationships. Uh, it was just a big step forward and, and naturally it resulted in so much adoration, huge passionate following. For Fire Emblem Three Houses, not just existing Fire Emblem fans, but also people who have never played Fire Emblem. You know, like, to a lot of people, Fire Emblem is Three Houses. But then, here comes Fire Emblem Engage. Engage, from the get-go, I thought was super obvious, but apparently it wasn't. I thought it was super obvious that it was not another Three Houses. Theoretically, you would think we would keep our expectations in check. But, you know, this example and the next example, not quite, you know, we're still going to hold on to them and hope. And, well, surprise, surprise, it's not three houses. And if you look at the reviews, that's the story you'll see, right? Those high-end reviews, oh yeah, I've been wanting more of a classic Fire Emblem experience. I love the battles of Fire Emblem the most. This is what I want them to focus on. Lower end of the reviews... Well, it's kind of underwhelming because Three Houses was going this direction, but they kind of just took a step backwards. I didn't like that. And the story isn't as serious as Three Houses. It's kind of more generic. And if you watch my Xenoblade videos, you have already know that I, <laughs> I can rant about this all day, about expectations dictating the perception of a game until a few years later. Now we all like it. And... and and I honestly think Engage will follow a similar path. Because let's say hypothetically, hypothetically, let's say, oh, for the future of Fire Emblem, we're going to have games that are more classic, but we'll also have games that are like Three Houses. Kind of like how like the Mario and Zelda games have the 3D Marios, the 3D Zeldas, the 2D Zeldas, the 2D Marios. You know, like these styles can coexist. Right, And I think we're at the point where people just aren't sure that they will. So they see this game and they're like, oh, this is a threat. <laughs> this is a threat to the Three Houses gameplay I liked. No, get it away from me. You know, that kind of thing. And then once that happens, <laughs> I guarantee you a lot more internet discourse will pick up of like, wait a second, Fire Emblem Engage was underrated. Why did it get an 82? I don't understand. Like, no, you should understand. <laughs> it's very clear. <laughs> Sometimes you can't get the full context out of just reading the reviews, which is, you know, I'll give another example of that. But in this case, no, you, you can. <laughs> in this case, if you read the reviews, you will see the context. And, and you know, props to that, because I think it's very important to set those proper expectations. To say, hey, if you like Three Houses and that's what you want, you're probably not going to like it. If you're just more of a Fire Emblem fan in general, if you're a tactics fan in general, this game is pretty dope. <laughs> like, I think that is a very fair, balanced, crucial uh, status quo to have. But people will probably just look at the score and think it's an underwhelming Fire Emblem game. So, yeah. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Sorry, sorry. I forgot an extremely integral component of this story. It's my favorite five-letter word in history. The elephant in the room. Anime. One of the biggest lessons I've learned in life is when a non-anime fan sees anime, they're very upset. <laughs> they're, they get very bitter. They <laughs> it's funny because this has already happened within the Fire Emblem franchise, you know, the pre-Awakening days. Awakening and Fates, especially Fates, was where like it became really anime. And then Three Houses went back to a more like, hey, you know, Westerners, <laughs> whitewashers out there. <laughs> All right, sorry, that was a joke. Relax. It's okay. You know, you can like this game without liking anime. But then here comes Engage, which is just, at least visually, is unapologetically anime. And I love it. I love how colorful it is. 
but I know a lot of people won't like that. Now it's important to note, this is a game that has not come out yet. Maybe I'll play it and I won't like it. But regardless, my point is, is that it's important to understand why a game got that score. Because otherwise, that score is meaningless. Like, what are you doing? Now, if we want to talk about games and expectations, one of, if not the most egregious example to me, commonly considered a 2D platforming masterpiece. It is a game that if you were to Google or YouTube nowadays, you would see overwhelming praise. That game, one of my favorite games again, is Donkey Kong Country Tropical Freeze. Incredible game. But look at the review of the original Wii U version. An 83. 83, by the way, is also a good score, just like an 82 is. But, as I've said, commonly considered a 2D platforming masterpiece here. You know, you don't really associate that high of a praise with a low 80. Unlike Fire Emblem Engage, you're going to need a little more than the reviews themselves to understand. In fact, I don't think you'll truly understand unless you were there in that point in history. Okay, but I'll try my best to explain. So, <laughs> Donkey Kong Country Tropical Freeze was developed by the developers known as Retro Studios. Retro Studios used to make Metroid Prime, the Metroid Prime trilogy. And back in those days, a few years before Tropical Freeze, there was another Metroid game that came out, not developed by Retro Studios. They made Metroid Other M, a game that was a flop <laughs> in more ways than one. Now, around that same time, Retro Studios made Donkey Kong Country Returns. We just saw Metroid flop, and we don't want Metroid to flop. Retro Studios is still making good games, so please give Metroid back to Retro Studios so we can course correct. At least give Retro Studios something different, because they're so talented that, like, I would like them to do other things as well. And then, well, turns out, they did not do either of those things. They made Donkey Kong Country Tropical Freeze. And from the moment <laughs> this game was announced, there was a grudge towards it, okay? Again, you won't fully understand unless you were there at that time. But people did not want this game to exist because why was Retro Studios making another Donkey Kong game? Nobody expected it, nobody asked for it, and that unfortunately became that game's identity. It's just human nature. Right? When you have a specific desire or expectation, it's hard to just shake that off. Right? Like, I try my best to judge games as fairly as possible when they come out. Just judge it for what it is, because I'm trying to avoid situations like this, where I just look like a clown <laughs> a couple of years later. Just like everybody else did when Donkey Kong Country Tropical Freeze came out. The expectations can often overshadow what the game actually is like how good it actually is and and it's it's annoying it's it's very annoying I, this is why i've talked about this in multiple videos it's annoying <laughs> and just in case you've been doubting my praise donkey kong country tropical freeze got a port on the switch that port barely added anything of value some would say it added nothing of value not only that it was ten dollars at least usd more expensive so it was more expensive while pretty much being the same game and it got a higher metacritic score because people realized wait a second we were being dumbasses <laughs> this actually leads the segues to another scenario of context because it's not just expectations it's not just expectations it's also like what kind of game it is i'm not saying everybody thinks this way, but generally, critics and just people I've seen alike, when you look at a port, remaster, or remake, even if this game is great, how good is it as a port? How good is it as a remaster? How good is it as a remake? Usually they get lower. An example, Super Mario 3D World. Now, Mario 3D World is another example of expectations. No, it's not a real 3D Mario game, but not everybody loves it, of course. It got a lower review score for the enhanced port on the Switch, even though, unlike Tropical Freeze, it is objectively 
a better video game. It has online, it's sped up the movements, it's objectively better, and it has Bowser's Fury. Still, it got lower than the original review score because it all comes back, well, it's a port, so we're judging this game differently from how we would have when it first came out, which as we've discussed, it was already pretty flawed. <laughs> Thankfully, the second point that I have for you, I can just get out of the way pretty quickly, <laughs> you know, because we've already kind of touched on it, right? And that second point is that opinions can change over time. Whether it's your own or someone else's opinion changing over time, as people get older, as time passes, there is a different audience who are talking about these games, right? And maybe that generation thinks differently than the generation that used to talk about that game, right? And I know it sounds like weird because the internet, it's not like it's been around for hundreds of years, but even like a five-year gap between generations can often be enough for a game's perception to change. But regardless, it's not just about like the age of what you are, the nostalgia you have, whether or not you grew up with it. No, it's also just because, well, I, maybe I just reevaluated it, right? Just as simple as that. Maybe I just, you know, I realized I was wrong. I realized I was being too harsh. Whatever it is, sometimes simply, I know it's, I know it's hard to believe on the internet. <laughs> sometimes simply, your opinion can change. So I'm only going to give you one example here, just so we can make up for some lost time. Because <laughs> that first point, I, re I just really was super passionate about that one. But this one... I'm going to use a game that is highly critically acclaimed. But nowadays, uh, you, you see polar opposites of people. And that is Sonic Adventure 2. Sonic Adventure 2 has an 89 on Metacritic. Granted, there's not that many reviews. But still, if you were there around that time, you would know both critically and also the player base, really in love with this game. But nowadays, it's, it's a little different. There are many, many people who played this game when they were younger, like me, who loved it and will defend it until the day they die. That's not me. But <laughs> I still really enjoy this game, even though it hasn't aged the best, which that can also be an influence in terms of opinions changing. Sometimes the game just doesn't age that well, right? But in this case, Many people just love Sonic Adventure 2, and I think that's great. But then, there's that other side, where they're like, wait a second, this game sucks. <laughs> a lot of people don't like Sonic Adventure 2, or at the very least, they think it's nowhere near as good as they initially thought it was. Not because it aged poorly, but because just fundamentally, like you have the Sonic levels, right? But then you have like the, the other friends of Sonic. Well, it's still beloved. It's nowhere near as beloved as it used to be. And for reasons that, you know, I think is fair, right? It's not just about the game aging. It's about, oh, we've actually re-examined these particular gameplay sections. And yeah, they weren't actually that great. Because sometimes when a game first comes out, you kind of ride the high. Those positives can, can just carry you throughout the whole game, right? But then over time, Maybe you look back, and you're like, oh, actually, there was more negatives than I cared to acknowledge. You know, I was so focused on these positives that, like, these negatives are actually kind of, like, dumb. <laughs> you know, opposite can happen. Maybe you were too focused on the negatives, and then you realize, ah, well, you know, now that I'm, like, a year out, I can see why people like that game more than I do. You know, like, opinions can change. I just wanted to bring up an example of one that was really highly acclaimed and then just kind of, like, I don't want, again, it didn't, like, drop down... <laughs> It's more just like ups and downs here. You know, people can can make their own decision on how they feel about that game. Number three is perhaps the most important. It's essentially the main idea of this whole video. Because, you know, even if you don't want to believe that context matters, even if you don't want to believe that opinions change over time, even if you want to ignore everything I just said, the fact is just fundamentally... You can find within yourself, you know this already, just that fundamental idea of, hey, let me look at this score because then I'll know whether or not I'll like it. Just that fundamental idea is flawed. It, it doesn't make sense. And there's several examples I can point to. This is kind of a low blow, but it, came, it, it didn't come out recently. But 
it is recent enough that it's just hard to ignore. The Last of Us Part 2. I really enjoyed this game. This is not me shitting on this game. But many people did, right? If you just look at that score, you will never know that that game got a lot of backlash. With the internet, you should know that that game got a lot of backlash. Some reasons were valid, other ones not so valid. Let's not get into that. I know I've been explaining the context, but I think it's better if we just <laughs> leave the context aside for this one. Um, yeah, those were not great times. Anyway, apologies for having so many Nintendo examples. I grew up with Nintendo. I have the most knowledge about them. And I know it's crazy. I know it's crazy to say. But if I talk about something, I want to, like, actually know about it. <laughs> Three fan favorite Nintendo games. If you're a Nintendo fan and you're watching this video, you probably love at least one of these games. So I'm like turning this on you, you know? This third point about scores not equating to whether or not you'll like it, like I'm I'm giving you, I'm, I'm flipping this back all around you. We're gonna go from highest rated to lowest rated. The highest being a 78, <laughs> okay? What game got a 78? Luigi's Mansion. Now look, I love this game. Great game. That's a fair score, but come on. <laughs> plenty of people who love this game. There's plenty of people who still think it's the best Luigi's Mansion. I think those people are insane, but it's okay. Because the fact is, is that you love that game despite what the critics say. You love that game despite what that score says, okay? Despite what those reviews say, you were able to form your own opinion. And here's the thing that I almost forgot to say. 7 out of 10s are not bad. I'm tired of it, okay? I understand if it's this AAA budget, highly anticipated game, and it gets a 70 Metacritic. I understand why that's disappointing, and you might think it's a bad game. That's fine. That's fine, okay? Because AAA budget, you get a little bump in the points. <laughs> Production value, graphics. 70s. There's so many games in the 70s that you probably love. That's why I'm bringing up these games. Let's go to the next one. Kirby Air Ride. Now, I'll admit, I, I think the review score is a little harsh. It's in the 60s. I think it should be, like, very low 70. There's a lot of fans of it that are really passionate about this game. And most of it's because of City Trial, <laughs> which is very unique and special mode. Regardless of the reason, like, this game has so many fans, right? If, if you were to bring this game up nowadays, you'll probably be reciprocated with a lot of adoration, right? Oh, yeah. That game was so fun, underrated. It should get a sequel, you know? Like, you would never expect that kind of talk. It doesn't matter what the score is at this point. What matters now is that, hey, so many people decided that they like it anyway. And guess what? That's going to prevail over time. But this final example is the example to end all examples. I hope you can relate to this. It is my favorite game from this franchise. Okay, and even if it wasn't, even if I never played this game, I have heard so much praise about this game. Its fans are super passionate. I will tell you what. And despite all that, its Metacritic score is a 54. <laughs> okay, you would not expect that much love and passion for a game that got in the 50s, let alone the 60s, let alone for some of you, even the 70s. This game, somewhat niche Nintendo game, Pokemon Mystery Dungeon Explorers of Sky. This is my favorite Pokemon game, and if you've never heard of it, I promise you, there are many people who share that sentiment. But I'm not saying the scores are wrong. When you have a simple game that's also really tedious, yeah, I get it. <laughs> I get that most people will probably not like this game, or at least they won't like it as much as I did, and other people did. But the people who do like it, the people who get into it, they freaking absolutely love this game. And you're never going to get that from just looking at a score. You're never going to know. You're just going to think, oh, that game sucks. You're never going to know that there's this very passionate following who really love this game for incredibly valid and valuable reasons. It's not just us being contrarians. It's not just us, like, nitpicking certain parts of the game that are really good. No, like, this game is special, just straight up. Like, it is a special game. Anybody who has played it, or at least heard of it, you should know what I'm talking about. Just some things you, you don't, you should, you're just not going to know. You're just not going to know <laughs> until you either just play it yourself or 
you do more like research that actually tailors to you. And that's what I want to end this video on because you're probably like, well, if, if not the critic reviews and the Metacritic score, what am I supposed to do, Nara? Games are pricey nowadays. What am I to do? I'm not going to spend hours researching it. What am I to do? Well, I'll tell you what to do. Okay. I just kind of said it. You have to appeal to your interests. Okay. When you look at a critic score, that is not tailored to you. And the best way to get an opinion, a recommendation, or just a general idea of the game that is specifically tailored to your interests is to ask a friend or relative who has played that game or at the very least is more familiar with that game or franchise than you. And I understand... <laughs> Not everybody has access to this, especially with more niche games. I get it. Social anxiety. You don't want to be a bother. I get it. But if, if you're willing to do that and you have access to them, please just ask. <laughs> just ask. It's better. It's so much better. I would say you should do both these things. But in case you don't, you can't do the former. You should especially do this. And it's looking at a YouTuber or Twitch stream. Not necessarily for their specific opinion, but just listening to their opinion and also what they're presenting with the gameplay. I don't want you to fall into this trap that I that I can sense a lot. Do not listen to just one person. The whole friend and relative thing, that's different. Well, it's it's the same as in like you should ideally get more than one opinion, right? You should do multiple things, not just one opinion. But at least that, it's specifically tailored to you, okay? Your favorite YouTuber does not give a shit about you. <laughs> Your favorite Twitch streamer, you might know them because you chat, but they don't actually know you. If you like that reviewer, that YouTuber, rather, because you guys have so many shared interests and what they've said really resonates with how you feel, then okay, I understand that. Even then, I still think you should get other opinions because that review, that video is still not tailored to you. But I can at least understand it, right? Oftentimes though, people will just listen to it and, and just be like, oh, well, I like your content, so I'm gonna trust your opinion. <laughs> Which, no, no, <laughs> okay? You need, to, you need to understand why you, you are listening to this video, while you're watching this video. Okay, this applies to me too. Just because you like Xenoblade, and I like Xenoblade, does not mean that you'll like Mystery Dungeon. It doesn't mean that you'll feel the same way as I do about every game that I've talked about on this video. You need to understand, especially if you watch this YouTuber or Twitch streamer because they're funny, <laughs> Let's say, for example, you're, you're subscribed to this YouTube channel, right? And they make this video on an older game. You've never played it. You at least know it's it's generally positive reception. But then their video, nah, nah, nah. They're going to tell you why it sucks. And they're going to tell you why it sucks while making you laugh. And then a lot of times, if you look at the comments or maybe you yourself, you'll think, they've got a point. This game does suck. <laughs> I know that was a tangential rant, but I just had to like make sure I got that out of the way because I really do think watching YouTube videos, watching Twitch streams is so powerful. It really is. It, it, it's so easy to do if you have internet. It's extremely easy to get a more accurate idea of whether or not you'll like it by doing those things. But I have to put in that asterisk because I've also seen other people just kind of blindly follow the opinions of one person. It's, it, it, no, <laughs> no, that's not what I mean. It's like you have this beautiful thing here that's so useful and you're using it for that. That's kind of the internet in general though, right? Oh, here's another thing. Just because they have a lot of views, don't think that's like, oh, you know, I'll get the most accurate opinions here because look, look at all the views. No, that's also not a factor. So what I would say is... Maybe you're following a Twitch streamer who's following this game you're interested in. Or if not, you can go to the Twitch directory and you can find a stream. And honestly, like, just ask, right? Like, just ask politely. Don't, don't just be like, hey, what do you think about this game? All right, see ya. Like, 
or, oh, you're wrong, you know, be polite about it. Be courteous, you know, to tie it back to the, the whole friend relative thing as well. Like you're actually in an engaged conversation where you can learn more. Like a conversation is way more than you reading about it <laughs> or looking at a score. Last but not least, you might be asking, well, Nara, why can't I just go on Metacritic or another website and read the <laughs> read the user reviews? <laughs> I can't even finish. <laughs> what a ridiculous idea. Don't do that. In all seriousness, I'm not saying, hey, this is wrong to do. I'm just saying there's so many options and probably options that are way better than the ones you're doing. And they don't actually take that much effort. Like, I think it's cool. I think it's a fun thing to do, honestly. I understand if you don't have time, if you're too lazy, I get it. But this is not an attack. I was joking at the beginning. It's not an attack on you, okay? You didn't do anything wrong. I'm just saying you could do better. And, I, and I'm disappointed in you. <laughs>